Okay, so just a couple of quick things to get the class started, or the meeting, rather. Um, we will have a test next week. I'm going to give you two days to take the exam. Uh, I will not upload it on Monday because it's a holiday, but you will have uh, Tuesday through Thursday to complete the exam. Again, it's worth 100 points. Um, you do have a quiz this week. The quiz will mainly be on uh, chapters five, four and five um, and a little bit of the lab material. Um, what else? Oh, there is another quick thing I need to mention with, uh, I don't know if it's this class or I forgot which class it was actually. It might've been both classes, but uh, there was an issue with the virtual lab. So the lab points were, um, there were some points provided for the one of the virtual labs in the very beginning of the, the semester. Uh, it was the tutorial. The tutorial is actually not worth any points. That was a mistake by uh, uh, that I made through McGraw Hill, uh, the, the Connect app. Um, it was just uh, an issue I was having because I really didn't uh, know how to adjust the points or remove the points entirely from the assignments. So that was my fault. That assignment should not be worth any points. Okay. Again, uh, 100 points is way too much for uh, a virtual lab uh, tutorial. So uh, for those of you who thought that um, you were gonna have the 100 points, no, I, I, I went ahead and del deleted that assignment from Canvas. And I'll send an email out um, shortly kind of detailing that. So again, you'll have the exam Tuesday. Uh, I'll upload it uh, to both classes for those of you who are listening in, in both classes. Um, so Tuesday and my Thursday class will have it. Uh, you will have um, Monday off. My Thursday class will get a, a small lecture um, and a review. If anyone would like, please email me to get that review on uh, Tuesday. Okay, uh, for my Monday, Wednesday class. You're more than welcome to attend. Um, I just would like to keep both my classes on the same pace, but I can definitely review for, with both classes, given that your office hours are also on, uh, on Tuesday as well. Okay, so just let me know. Um, I, I'll probably send the review lecture out to everybody and provide it for everybody on, on Tuesday. But if you would like to attend live with your questions, um, please let me know. And that's gonna be the full, the full lecture, okay? Um, just so we can keep everyone on the same page, right? So Tuesday review, test is also uh, going to be uploaded next Tuesday. Uh, and then you will have a quiz this week that will mainly be on five, uh, five, four and five, chapters four and five and a little bit of lab material. Um, and then one last thing, we will also not uh, be having, I think for the most part, we're not going to be having lab uh, separate at, at a separate Zoom time. It's just much easier to to record everything um, at one time and then have you scroll up and look for uh, the lab uh, start component, okay, or the lab start time rather than ha having two separate lectures. I feel like that's just not very um, not very efficient, right? You're gonna have multiple Zoom links. Uh, people get confused. Um, Keep it all in one recording, and I feel like uh, it, it'd just be much easier for everybody since the, the lab, um, the lab lectures are relatively short. They're usually under 15 minutes, so I can run through the labs really quick um, without having too, too much issue. Okay, so um, I won't send a link out at 9:45. I just, I just think it's kind of useless, so or pointless. All right, um, let's go ahead and screen share. We'll get started. Okay, so chapter six, uh, cellular respiration, uh, energy from food. Again, this is gonna build off of uh, Monday's lecture. Um, so, this is going to be probably one of the more complex ideas that you're going to need to understand in this class, okay? Uh, I teach this as well in micro and those students have had general biology previously and they still have a very, very difficult time understanding uh, this 
So please pay attention. There is a lot of videos on YouTube and, and elsewhere that you can watch to help you understand the different processes. Uh, but essentially what I want is for you to understand the main idea of what cellular respiration is, how uh, the cell utilizes this um, metabolic pathway or how they use these different metabolic pathways uh, to uh, gain energy from uh, glucose, right? We're going to talk a little bit about fermentation, photosynthesis, but we'll cover photosynthesis in much more detail later. Okay, uh, we're just at chapter seven. So next week. Um, but yeah, you're going to need to be paying attention. And you're definitely going to need to be studying. Okay, so this is going to be very, very difficult for many people to, to understand. So I'm trying to scare you now so you can definitely either crack the book or uh, go through the PowerPoint slides and, and the lecture to really understand uh, the process, okay? Uh, I don't really need you to know a lot of the enzymes that are involved here, the little the proteins, right? Um, but I do need you to know the steps. I do need you to know um, what the overall goal is of, of each pathway. Um, and then I'm not even going to have you memorize the end products. Uh, maybe the big end products are going to be important, but again, um, this is not, uh, most of the, the enzymes and the, the individual steps are not, are not ter too terribly important. Um, they're even difficult for me to memorize. Okay. So I would not have you, uh, memorize that. Right. But just pay attention and, um, Please stop me if you have any questions so I can better explain it if something is not clear, okay? All right, so cellular respiration. So why is it important? The cells of your brain uh, burn, th uh, burn through a quarter pound of glucose each day. So uh, I think I talked about muscles and exercising and, and I briefly mentioned it last class. Um, we talked about how efficient um, your muscles are. They're about 35% efficient. Right, they use about, or your body's about thirty-five percent efficient. So you can consume the 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 food, and you harvest just about thirty-five percent of that energy that's found in that that food after digestion. Right, but if you can see here, the quarter pound of glucose each day, which is it's quite a lot of glucose. Right, your brain, again, normal metabolic functioning of your brain burns a, a tremendous amount of calories. Okay. Uh, normal bodily functions burn a tremendous amount of calories. You working out does not burn uh, um, a huge amount of calories compared to the normal functioning of your body. That's where the majority of your 2,000 calories or 2,000 or around 2,000 calorie diet is going to go to. It's going to go to your normal bodily functions, right? Your your brain, your uh, your metabolism, different pathways that are or uh, chemical reactions that are occurring in your body that require energy, right? Keeping your temperature up, okay? Um, these are all very, very important things. Keeping homeostasis in your body. And homeostasis is just referring to keeping that normal baseline, right? Your, your salt concentrations in your cells. Um, making sure that your blood is clean, your kidneys, right? Your liver is detoxifying chemicals, things like that, okay? Um, so it's, it's very important that we have a very efficient source to gain energy to do these processes, okay? And one of the ways we, we uh, uh, gain energy is through respiration, through catabolic reactions, right? Breaking down glucose molecules uh, and storing the energy found in glucose molecules uh, in a quick, uh, uh, quickly uh, utilizable uh, um, states like adenosine triphosphate right atp so the overall goal is to get the atp from glucose in order to perform these various functions right and we saw how useful atp was um they could contract your muscles they could um help bring in molecules help regulate cells uh, uh, salt concentrations okay um so glucose or atp is very very important glucose is always is is uh, uh also very important for, for creating ATP, okay? Um, so the metabolic processes that produce acid in your muscles after a hard workout are similar to the processes that produce pepperoni, soy sauce, yogurt, and bread. And this is referring to a different type of uh, energy process, right? So this is going to be fermentation, okay? 
Um, so there's different types of fermentation, right? There is uh, um, the fermentation that you have to make alcohol, so alcoholic fermentation. There's also propiono, propionic acid fermentation or lactic acid fermentation, which our muscles perform, right? Bacteria can make a lot of or perform a lot of different uh, um, a lot of different types of fermentation as well. Um, and many of times, bacteria are going to be utilized uh, to flavor certain types of foods, such as soy sauce or uh, different types of meats, yogurts, and bread, right? Um, and bacteria can can make a lot of different byproducts, right? Propionobacteria, uh, which actually is, is responsible for making the holes in Swiss cheese, right? So um, during that process, the organism is grown with the cheese and it produces carbon dioxide through that fermentative process. Uh, these carbon dioxide bubbles create the, 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 the pores or the holes in cheese, right? This is also the same organism that can cause cystic acne uh, for individuals who have cystic acne, right? They, this is just a bacterial organism called propionobacterium. Uh, it's a specific genus of bacteria that can grow in your follicle and cause those large uh, cysts uh, in your on, on an individual's face, right? Um, and again, these are just different fermentative processes, but we'll talk about uh, a little bit about the fermentation, fermentative processes and why and how they occur, right? And the big idea here is we talked, I think we briefly mentioned fermentation. Uh, we performed that, we should have gotten through that lab already, um, is anaerobic environments. Uh, anaerobic environments are key. Okay, so uh, we do have something in common with the sports car. We both require air uh, intake system to burn our fuel efficiently, right? We are obligate aerobes. We require oxygen as our terminal electron acceptor. So what does that mean, our terminal electron acceptor? The oxygen is going to accept uh, uh, these electrons that will then be removed out of the cell uh, after respiration. That's very important because you can't have this buildup of, of electrons, okay? Um, this is also can be problematic because it can create uh, uh, free radicals, right? So free radicals are like hydrogen peroxide, uh, and this just this is a byproduct of our cellular functions, right? This, uh, these uh, um, things like hydro, uh, uh, things that are like hydroxy radicals can cause uh, uh, oxidizing events in the body. So it can destroy DNA, destroy tissues. Um, this is why people always recommend eating antioxidants, okay? So these are gonna be chemicals that can help prevent or help combat the formation of these, uh, these peroxy radicals, okay? Um, a peroxy radical, again, is like hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is not good for you. I know we use it as an antiseptic to clean out wounds and skin if you get a cut and an abrasion, but again, that's why we use it as a, 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 an antiseptic, right? You can pour it on your skin because it occurs naturally in your body, right? But that 4% hydrogen peroxide solution is also toxic to microorganisms. Um, hint, hint, we do have an enzyme called catalase that breaks that hydrogen peroxide down. So again, uh, we need uh, oxygen. We also have uh, different issues that are caused by utilizing oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, right? There are some microorganisms where oxygen is toxic. Okay, where the, they lack um, many of those enzymes that um, help break down the free radicals. Therefore, oxygen can oxidize uh, that environment or that, that organism, and that organism does not like it, right? It cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. But we can. We need and utilize oxygen readily. Okay? All right. So energy flow and uh, chemical cycling in the biosphere. All organisms require energy to survive. Much of, that, uh, much of the energy that is provided to these various organisms originates from the sun, right? So again, we require energy. Um, energy from the sun is, is probably the most important thing on earth uh, when you consider it, um, right? We do have uh, energy sources uh, in the ocean or in hot springs, things like that. So deep ocean vents uh, where you have heat and uh, organisms that can survive over that. But the majority of the life on the surface of the earth is, excuse me, 
is uh, maintained by the sun's energy, right? So plants can harvest that energy. Uh, uh, they can carbon fixate, right? So they can make glucose with the sun's help. Um, and again, it's from the energy provided and uh, the chloroplast will then uh, utilize that energy again to, to grab CO2 from the atmosphere and uh, fix it into uh, glucose. Ooh, excuse me. All right, photosynthesis, the process by which plants, algae, and some bacteria transform light energy to chemical energy stored in the bonds of sugars, right? So remember, uh, those sugar bonds, those fat bonds, um, even some of the protein and uh, DNA, uh, those bonds have stored chemical energy, right? The stored chemical energy is, uh, again, going to be uh, those carbon to hydrogen bonds, those C to H bonds, that's the energetic bond that you see, right? Once you break that bond, you could then, um, that breaking of that bond will then provide some sort of energy uh, for that cell, right? That potential energy is again, carbon to hydrogen. This process requires an input of carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O, and produces oxygen gas, O2, as a waste product, okay? So again, photosynthesis, we'll cover in much more detail later, but just know um, that green plants, uh, algae, bacteria utilize this pathway. And again, it's, it's using light, uh, using the sun to uh, have potential energy or to create potential energy uh, stored in, in uh, sugars or carbon to hydrogen bonds. Okay, so carbon fixation. So what we think about carbon fixation uh, is grabbing the CO2 and sticking it together in order to make glucose, right? Because glucose is C6H12O6. Again, you need six uh, CO2 molecules, um, as well as some little tampering to get, uh, to get that sugar created, right? All right. Um, I think someone's having issues logging in and out. Uh, producers and consumers, you have an autotroph, an organism that makes its own food from inorganic ingredients, thereby sustaining itself without eating other organisms or their molecules. So again, this is autotroph, auto is self. Um, uh, so think of this as organisms that can make food for themselves, right? So plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria are autotrophs. They can harness the energy from the sun rather than us to go and actually consume uh, plant, plant matter or uh, other, other smaller animals or other animals in general in order to uh, utilize their energy, right? Which they have from plants. So an organism that cannot make its own f organic food, molecules from inorganic ingredients must obtain them by consuming other organisms or their organic products. A consumer or a decomposer in a food chain, right? This is anything that something else, whether it's a dead uh, or alive, okay? Um, like fungus or fungi, they are saprophytic. They do break down um, organic matter, dead, dying organic matter, and recycle that energy um, for their cells, okay? Uh, producer, again, a producer is gonna be an autotroph, an organism that makes organic food from molecules from CO2, water, and other inorganic raw materials. So just think of a producer is someone that produces food for everybody else. It's the lifeblood of any or, um, uh, biological system, right? You need a base, uh, feed everyone from the top, right? Um, and these are plants. These are plants, bacteria, algae in the ocean. Um, th these are all very, very important. Plankton, right? That's also a very, very important food source. Um, makes up the majority of the calories that are trans, uh, uh, transferred to the top, right? And this is why you have much more of these microscopic organisms or much more plants, much more producers or autotrophs in the environment, right? You need these in large numbers to sustain um, a population or sustain organisms that are uh, uh, consumers or heterotrophs, right? Because those heterotrophs are living off of these uh, autotrophs or producers. So they must make up the majority of the organisms found in that system, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to even have predators or larger mammals or larger organisms because you need a transfer of energy up the chain, right? You need to have a big 
uh, a group of consumer or producers and autotrophs in order to support those heterotrophs or consumers. Okay. An organism that obtains or a consumer is an organism that, that obtains its food by eating plants or by eating animals that have eaten plants, right? So everything is based on uh, uh, the the sun and the sun's energy, right? And, and photosynthesis. Everything's pretty much uh, utilizing or uh, uh, taking that energy from that from the sun and then carbon fixating, right? Creating this source of energy and then providing that energy for everyone above that uh, that organism in that food chain, right? Um, and consumer again, eating uh, plants here is referring to just any uh, producer. Excuse me. All right. So producer and consumer, a koala consumer eating leaves produced by a photosynthetic plant, which is again a producer, which makes sense. And eucalyptus leaves, right? So um, here's a koala eating eucalyptus. All right. Very quick. So energy flow and chemical cycling in ecosystems. So Energy flows through an ecosystem entering as sunlight and exiting as heat. In, in contrast, chemical elements are recycled within an ecosystem. All right. So photosynthesis, the sun, this is a base of the ecosystem, right? This is where we're going to get the majority of the energy and the carbohydrates that are going to be passed down to our, our, uh, auto, our, our heterotrophs or our um, consumers, okay? Right? Our baseline is here. This is where we get the majority of, of our um, of our energy, right? Almost all of our energy, right? So we have glucose being made, plus oxygen being excreted by the the plants or these photosynthetic organisms. Again, sugar, oxygen, they provide us with the lifeblood of the world, right? We need oxygen to survive. Uh, oxygen makes up a chunk, a portion of our atmosphere, um, and again, it, it, it's nitrogen oxygen, CO2, uh, and then other trace gases that are found, okay? Um, but again, plants provide us with, with that, uh, or photosynthetic organisms provide us with that uh, a key component, those two key components in our, uh, uh, in our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Cellular respiration, which we'll get into in great detail. Again, this is going to be from our heterotrophs, or those organisms that do consume the plants, right? Um, they utilize cellular respiration uh, and mitochondria, uh, harvest food energy to produce ATP. And this is what's gonna drive our metabolic processes. This is what is going to provide us with the energy, this respiration, cellular respiration and this metabolic pathway, okay? Um, after this is uh, a cellular respiration, some of the byproducts of that is water and carbon dioxide, right? When you breathe in, you breathe out, you release carbon dioxide that is uh, formed during our normal um, respiring uh, pathways. Um, and you do release out that carbon dioxide into the environment, which then can be picked up by plants, right? And there's this, there's this play on that. There's a lot of uh, uh, interplay between life um, in terms of what is, is maintained and what's consistent, right? Uh, plants produce sugar and oxygen, which we need to survive we produce that carbon dioxide into that atmosphere, which plants need in order to carbon fixate, right? So um, very, very important uh, uh, um, process, okay? The, the expulsion of oxygen by plants where we uh, uptake the oxygen and their glucose and then vice versa, we provide that water and carbon dioxide. Again, water is not that big of a deal because there's water everywhere, but uh, carbon dioxide again in the atmosphere. Uh, crucial um, for for plants, uh, and this was a big process back uh, before the the advent of, of or the use of fossil fuels. Right now, we have way too much carbon dioxide in the environment, uh, which is not good. Okay, uh, and we have way less plants, so we have way less forests, uh, um, uh, much less uh, rainforest. Right, it's being issues, deforestation, things like that uh, in on the equator. Um, so. We're having less plants, increased uh, carbon dioxide output. Again, not good, not good for the environment, okay? So at one point, there was this interplay, there's this nice balance between the two. But now, um, again, fossil fuels have tipped the scales. We have much more carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is a, uh, a greenhouse gas, right? So these carbon uh, bonds, these double bonds with the CO2, 
uh, or the, these double bonds between the carbon and the oxygen uh, actually absorb light really well and UV radiation, um, maintaining or trapping heat within our atmosphere, again, causing the, the, the earth to warm. Talk about that later. But again, um, this was a very delicate process that was going on for many, many years until the advent of fossil fuels and the use of fossil fuels okay, causing issues. Okay. So cellular respiration, aerobic harvest of food from energy. We have aerobic uh, containing or requiring molecular oxygen, right? And we sh I showed you earlier right here, this image that we need oxygen to survive, right? This is a key component to respiration, okay? Uh, so cellular respiration is the aerobic harvesting of energy from food molecules, the energy releasing chemical breakdown of food molecules such as glucose and the storage of potential energy in a form that cells can use to perform work. It involves glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. And uh, chemiosmosis, right? So this, these four uh, key components, which we'll talk about in detail uh, in a minute, are crucial for cellular respiration. There's also, um, this is also considered, uh, um, we, we're going to talk about aerobic respiration, but there's also a pathway called anaerobic respiration, which we won't cover in great detail, or I'll mention it briefly, but uh, bacteria can utilize this pathway. Um, and essentially, it's respiration without oxygen, okay? Um, so air, anaerobic respiration. We use, like, other nitrogen sources like nitrate, nitrites. Um, but we require oxygen, so this is aerobic cellular respiration, okay? All right. All right, so how breathing is related to cellular respiration. When you inhale, you breathe in oxygen. The oxygen is delivered to your cells where it is used in cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is a waste product of cellular respiration. Again, diffuses from your cells to your blood and travels to your lungs where you exhale. You give off CO2, right? And this was, again, that play between plants and uh, or photosynthetic organisms and uh, heterotrophs or consumers, right? We as consumers will provide that oxygen or that CO2 uh, expulsion for the organisms that are requiring that CO2 to carbon fixate, right? Uh, plants need CO2 in, in the atmosphere in order to make glucose, okay? Uh, we need oxygen in order to break down glucose. So, again, this is a very uh, um, delicate and important play, uh, play that we have with plants or with photosynthetic organisms in that um, they need CO2 to survive, right? We need oxygen to survive. Uh, we need them to have CO2 to survive, and they need us to have oxygen for us to survive. Trust me. Plants can live um, just fine without us, <laughs> but we also uh, do require much of the resources they provide. Again, they are the base of that food chain. They're base of that food uh, uh, table. They are going to make the majority of the calories that are present in our world. Um, again, there's a very few environments that don't need photosynthetic organisms to have life, which are like deep ocean vents and uh, uh, hot springs, things like that. But the majority of that energy does come from the sun, okay? And again, there's a play between oxygen and CO2, right? Plants need CO2, we need oxygen. Okay, an overview of cellular respiration, just a quick little summary. C6H12O6, again, is going to be that glucose molecule uh, plus 6O2. Uh, so there's uh, many steps to get that into uh, 6 CO2 plus 6 uh, H2O, uh, and you get some energy out of that plus heat. Again, the heat will make up that uh, warming or that body temperature increase, right? Our uh, homeostasis uh, uh, temperature, uh, our homeostatic temperature. This can also be reversed, right? So C6 uh, or uh, 6CO2 plus 6 oxygen plus some energy will give you uh, glucose and oxygen, right? And this is the reverse, right? of, of uh, respiration. The reverse of respiration is photosynthesis and essentially the arrows are just going in the other direction, right? This is where plants will produce oxygen and produce sugar, okay? Whereas we consume sugar and consume oxygen but produce CO2 and water and energy, right? Whereas energy is needed to make uh, uh, CO2 and water into uh, uh, sugar and oxygen, okay? This energy can be provided from the sun, right? So this uh, can go either direction. This, this process with many steps can go in either direction. 
um, very important to note that I will test you on that. Okay. This is some, this is a, this overview of the processes is, is incredibly important for you to understand. Uh, you, I would memorize, or you should memorize this formula. I'm going to say that right now explicitly. Memorize this formula. C6, H12, O6 plus 6, O2. Uh, just, you can have an arrow. You don't need to put many steps. We'll give you 6, CO2 plus 6, H2O and energy. You don't need to put 32 ATP plus heat. Just energy, okay, right? And then you can say photosynthesis again, and I'll, I'll reiterate this when we go over photosynthesis. Uh, photosynthesis is going to be the reverse, right? Energy plus 6 H2O plus 6 CO2 is going to give you 6 oxygen plus C6H12O6, which is glucose, right? Right, sugar. So this can be reversed. This can uh, uh, go this way depending on respiration or photosynthesis. And you do need to know the directionality of this uh, uh, um, this equation, yeah, lots of words there. So respiration, arrows go this way towards uh, CO2 and uh, water, whereas uh, photosynthesis will be going the other way, right? You require uh, energy and then you have CO2 and water turned into or uh, uh, carbon fixated into uh, glucose, okay? All right, glycolysis. This is the multi-step chemical breakdown of a molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvic acid. The first stage of cellular respiration in organisms occurs in the cytoplasmic fluid. Citric acid cycle, a met metabolic cycle that is fueled by acetyl-CoA, formed after glycolysis and cellular respiration. All right, chemical reactions in the cycle complete the metabolic breakdown of glucose molecules to carbon dioxide. Right, or CO2. The cycle occurs in the matrix of mitochondria and supplies most of the uh, NADH molecules that carry energy to the electron transport chains, also referred to as the Krebs cycle. And we will talk about NADH in great depth. Okay, um, hopefully I get this across, um, even in my micro class with the students having a, back, a little bit of background in biology, it's still a very difficult concept for them to wrap their heads around. Um, so you just need to know brief uh, uh, idea of what um, this molecule does and why it's important, right? This enzyme, okay? So these are the two starting points for cellular respiration, glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Glycolysis is universal to uh, all organisms that, uh, oh, not all organisms, but glycolysis is universal to almost all of life, okay? Um, and this, again, is gonna be that breakdown of glucose, okay? This is that process that all animals, all multicellular animals do, do perform, eukaryotes, right? Breaking down of glucose is incredibly important. And this is done in the cytoplasm. This is the most ancient of the pathways, right? So this process was done first before anything else, right? Um, I briefly mentioned, I think, that mitochondria and Chloroplasts are ancient remnants of bacterial cells that have incorporated themselves into eukaryotes or our cells, right? But this process, again, um, heavily conserved and heavily, uh, uh, it's, it's ancient, right? So it's, it's been around since uh, cells existed in terms of use, utilizing glucose, okay? The citric acid cycle, again, takes place in the mitochondrion, uh, which, again, um, is a relatively newer process in comparison to glycolysis, which is ancient, right? I'm talking about uh, uh, evolutionary development, right? So early cells have utilized glucose. Citric acid cycle in the evolutionary timeline uh, came a little bit after, okay? Um, but we'll talk about it each in detail. So NADH, so an electron carrier, a molecule that carries electrons involved in cellular respiration and photosynthesis. NADH carries electrons from glucose and other fuel molecules. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, and deposits them at the top of the electron transport chain, which is in very important for producing ATP. NADH is generated during glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Okay? It's important to note that the citric acid cycle is much better at producing uh, NADH than glycolysis. Okay? But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So we have the electron transport um, chain, a reaction in which one or more uh, electrons are transferred to carrier molecules. A series of uh, such reactions um, called an electron transport chain 
can release the energy stored in high energy molecules such as glucose. Uh, see also electron transport chain. Oops. So the electron transport chain again is going to be producing um, electrochemical gradient, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this uh, electron transport chain is, is, is very, very important for producing uh, this potential energy that will then be utilized to make ATP. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I will, we'll, I'll show you what the electron transport chain is. Uh, NADH as well, um, just know that it's a carrier, electron carrier molecule, right? This is a protein that can carry or rip or remove electrons from a carbon source, okay? Um, and NADH, uh, um, again, needs to be converted into NAD plus in order to remove the electrons. NADH, again, is going to be a molecule when associated with the electrons, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of show you that in a minute, but um, just know what they do. They carry electrons, electron transport chain, important for um, um, a poten creating a potential energy, okay? So here we have a, an overview of what occurs uh, in the cell, right? We have the mitochondrion, uh, which is going to be found in plant animal cells as well as bacteria, or plant animal cells, and uh, even single cell organisms will have this. Um, and then bacteria will have a, a specific pathway uh, similar to this, but they will perform this in uh, their outer membranes, right? Because bacteria are much more simple. They do not have organelles, okay? Um, all right, so glycolysis, again, is going to be the first step to any of these pathways. So one thing I want to note before uh, moving forward with, this, with these processes uh, is glycolysis can occur without the mitochondria, okay? Glycolysis does not need the mitochondria. Glycolysis does not need oxygen. Glycolysis can work or be performed uh, or be, uh, um, or work without, with or without the mitochondria, okay? There are organisms that actually do not need mitochondria to survive, right? Um, I believe Giardia is one of them, so. If you know what Giardia is, it causes severe diarrhea um, when you drink like unfiltered water or water uh, um, that has been contaminated by the parasite, right? Giardia does not need uh, or does not have uh, mitochondria, right? So it does not have these, these metabolic pathways. Organisms can survive just on glycolysis, right? Um, do we ever not use mitochondria in, uh, in our, uh, our processes or in our body? Yes, right? We do have anaerobic uh, uh, fermentation or lactic acid fermentation in our muscle tissue, right? Right, lactic acid buildup. Um, you have the soreness associated with that. Um, it's actually through a different process, but we will not touch on that. Um, so glycolysis can work um, with or without this mitochondria. It, glycolysis can work in an anaerobic environment as well. Okay, and that is important to understand that this is separate from the mitochondrial uh, uh, metabolic pathways, okay? Our muscles can perform this. This is why we have lactic acid buildup in our muscle tissue. Um, um, we get the soreness, we get tired. Uh, again, this is important for individuals that do, are athletes that have uh, anaerobic, um, they, their muscles can go anaerobic in, in certain points of time, okay? So we'll talk about glycolysis first. Again, completely separate from the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. This can happen without the mitochondria, okay? Uh, again, fermentative processes are based on glycolysis, right? If we do not have oxygen, our cells will, will continue to perform glycolysis. This is much less inefficient without, uh, much le mu this is much less efficient uh, at making glycolysis or making ATP but it will still make ATP and keep cells alive, right? With, in unison with the mitochondrial, mitochondrion and the different pathways here, such as the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain, this provides a majority of the energy, whereas glycolysis is a start, okay? And it does produce uh, a net gain of energy as well. So how does glyco glycolysis work? Well, there's a few different things that occur. Here. And there's a few different things that I do need you to know about glycolysis, right? 
So in glycolysis, the team of enzymes splits glucose. So splitting of glucose is important. You need to split glucose into two, three carbon sugars. And if you remember, glucose is C6H12O6. There's six carbons, okay? So how do you split uh, uh, the glucose molecule? You need to invest energy, right? So the first step in glycolysis is the investment phase, right? So here you have the investment phase, energy investment phase, expense to ATP. So this 2 ATP will come on either end of this glucose molecule and phosphorylate this glucose molecule, right? Adding that phosphate energizes that molecule. And the energy that's provided by the initial investment is going to cause that molecule to be unstable, right? This unstable process is going to allow the splitting of that glucose molecule into two three-carbon molecules, right? These two three-carbon molecules can then go down uh, what is called the energy harvesting phase in, in glycolysis, right? There's two phases, energy investment, energy harvesting. The energy investment, our cells need to front the ATP in order to uh, uh, go down the, the glycolytic pathway, okay? Right, so eventually forming, uh, so when this glucose molecule splits, right, you add the phosphates on each side, causing this molecule to be unstable that will cause it to split. Um, eventually these will form two pyruvic acid molecules. After investing two ATP at the start of glycolysis, uh, this generates a total of four ATP directly. More energy will be harvested later from high energy electrons used to form NADH and from the two molecules of pyruvic acid, okay? Um, so these different steps uh, that are in the energy harvesting phase, right? So NAD plus is going to remove electrons, right? These two electrons, again, NA, forming NADH. Uh, and then you can harvest the, the, the two ATP after, okay? Uh, so these two phosphate groups. So let's talk about NAD for just a quick moment here. NAD is going to be very, very important, okay? Uh, especially in glycolysis. Without NAD, we do not have glycolysis. Um, NADH is also important, but it's important for our later metabolic functions in the mitochondria, okay? Um, if we do not have the mitochondria, mitochondria functioning, we need to still free up these molecules of NADH, okay? Uh, this needs to be converted back into NAD to perform this. Without glycolysis, you do not survive. Uh, uh, heterotrophs do not survive without glycolysis. Like, all organisms that, uh, all eukaryotes do not survive without glycolysis, okay? We need this to function. This is the, probably the most important thing in a cell, is to continue this process in order to survive. We have a total net gain of four ATP, okay? Uh, um, I'm sorry, we have a total net gain of two ATP. So we create four ATP, but again, if we subtract the two ATP that are lost in the beginning, we have a net gain of two, which is very, very, very inefficient in comparison to including the, uh, um, the citric acid and the ETC and, and uh, uh, the ATP synthase complex, right? But this process is, uh, is required for survival, okay? So even if this is the only thing that's occurring, we still get two ATP, we can still serve, that cell can still survive, okay? And again, this is done in the cytoplasm. But in order for this process to continue, we need NAD+. We have to have it, okay? Um, if the other processes do not work, NADH will, will, be, will, be, uh, will not, uh, NADH will not be allowed to be converted back into NAD, and then you have the stop or the stoppage of glycolysis, which is not good. The cell dies at that point. You cannot have this stopped at all. This needs to be continuously going on uh, in the body, okay? These two three carbon molecules, again, from the splitting of glucose, they are very important for later on, but again, for glycolysis, this can be a waste product, right? And so what we have with fermentation, oh, we'll talk about that later, but essentially just know that we need NAD. NAD is just as important. This is the, probably one of the most important steps to have this recycle, right? To have NADH drop these electrons off and have NAD come back in order for us to gain our ATP, right? 
If we don't have this removal of the electrons, we don't have our ATP molecules, okay? All right, that's, that's just, the, that's the probably the most important thing you need to know. No. NAD comes back, needs to be recycled NAD, from NADH, and then it can rip the electrons off and allow for the ATP to be created by this pathway, okay? That is the, one of the most important things in glycolysis in terms of the energy harvesting phase, whereas the energy investment, again, we add the ATP, make this molecule unstable, break glucose into two, and then you have these two separate pathways that are now running. All right, so the citric acid cycle is dependent on glucose, or glycolysis, sorry, and, and glucose for that matter, okay? Most, well, yeah, I'll say that. Sugar, all sugars typically in, in eukaryotes get converted into uh, 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 glucose, right? Um, remember we talked about sugars and isomers, uh, right? Fructose, sucrose, lactose, right? Lactose is disaccharide with galactose and glucose. Galactose will get converted into glucose in order to, to go down this glycolytic pathway, okay? Fructose, same thing, will get converted into glucose in order to go down uh, glycolysis, right? We have enzymes that can convert that uh, in our body in order to perform glycolysis, which is incredibly important. We need that for uh, a healthy functioning cell, okay? After glycolysis, we have the citric acid cycle. Again, incredibly important. We need this to function appropriately uh, in the cell. We need glycolysis in order to uh, have the citric acid cycle. Um, and then we need the citric acid cycle to have the electron transport chain. But we'll talk about uh, the citric acid cycle later. So a link between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, the, co the conversion of pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA. Remember that one molecule of glucose is split into two molecules of pyruvic acid. Therefore, the process shown here occurs twice for each starting glucose molecule. And we talked about that, right? We need this. And essentially, this process here is this, one of the sides of a glycolysis, right? So here we have... Um, the pyruvic acid uh, loses a carbon, a CO2. We have this NADH, uh, or this NAD coming to rip the electrons off of NADH. Again, then we can harvest the, uh, the uh, ATP after that event, right? But um, this NAD, again, does not, is not as important as the, uh, this NADH is not as important as NAD, again, because NAD plus will, allow for energy to be harvested in the cell. This is required for glycolysis. And this is going to be used to dump the electrons on uh, into the citric acid cycle. Or from, the, sorry, this will be used to dump the electrons down the electron transport chain. The citric acid cycle will uh, be important for removing more electrons from uh, this uh, uh, acetyl-CoA or acetyl-CoA molecule here, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay. You know what? This is, I don't like this one. This is provided for your book, but I am not too partial to this. This is better. I feel like this is much better. Okay. So acetyl-CoA, again, this is, this is created after glycolysis occurs. Uh, we'll plug into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Oh, I am not going to get through this lecture. It's okay. We'll stop in, in, uh, stop in 15 minutes. And we'll get through as much as we possibly can. All right, the Krebs cycle. So this requires acetyl-CoA, okay? Again, and it also um, is going to be feeding off of glycolysis, right? So this occurs after glycolysis is done, right? These are the byproducts of glycolysis. We get a net gain of two ATP, uh, two pyruvates, and two NADHs from glycolysis, right? So two NADHs, which are important for later, uh, two uh, pyruvic acids, will, which will then plug into um, the citric acid cycle, and net gain of two ATP, right? Because this ATP is essentially void because we use it for harvest, uh, for uh, harvesting our ATPs, okay? So two uh, ATP, two NADHs, and two pyruvic acids. Again, the pyruvic acid will plug into the citric acid, citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. 
right. So acetyl-CoA plugs into this cycle. What happens here? What is the main point of the cycle? You know, this looks scary. You have the removal of carbon dioxide, uh, right? This is referring to how many carbons are left on that chain. Uh, but what, what is essentially done here um, in this Krebs cycle? We have the removal of electrons, right? And uh, uh, it's in, uh, removed by NAD2, NADH. These NADH molecules are the most important thing from this, uh, this Krebs cycle, okay? You have a net gain of one ATP per single cycle. Two cycles is referring to the one single glucose, right? So one turn of this, uh, one pass through this cycle is half a glucose molecule, right? Because we have two acetyl or, or two pyruvic acids uh, um, produced by glycolysis. So therefore two turns will equal one glucose molecule, right? So uh, one, one half glucose molecule is just one turn. So we have one single cycle. So this is half a glucose molecule. Two cycles represents uh, one glucose molecule, right? So what's our total uh, net from this? We have four carbon dioxides, which are going to be expelled through your breathing. So this is where our CO2, again, is produced. We uh, breathe or off-gas our CO2 from the Krebs cycle. So this is where our CO2 comes off when we breathe, okay? We have a net gain of ATP. So this is very inefficient, right, in terms of energy. Uh, uh, um, removal, right? Well, this does not make a lot of energy. This removes the same amount of energy as uh, as glycolysis does, which is not a lot, right? Um, especially if we're harvesting six NADHs and two FADs, okay? So six NADHs, right? Whereas glycolysis only removes two NADHs. So this is not conducive. This is not good at producing energy from this pathway in terms of ATP. We only get two ATP from one glucose, right? This is the same as glycolysis. We should just use glycolysis because look at all these other byproducts we get. Uh, if we didn't have the electron transport chain, these would not be important. These molecules here would not be important for uh, energy production, right? Um, so keep that in mind. So these uh, six NADHs, are gonna be used to dump electrons onto the electron transport chain. This is what's important. FADH is going to also dump electrons, but they're not as energy rich, okay? Uh, but just know that they are essentially NADHs. They are important. They're dumping the electrons off onto the, the electron transport chain, okay? So I do really would, I, you do need to know uh, the, sing, the single cycle and two cycles and what these represent, right? This is one half glucose, this is two glucoses that will cause a turning of the citric acid cycle, okay? All right, so the electron transport chain. And this is where NADH is important. This is where those molecules can come and dump their electrons down this electron transport chain, and then we could harvest that energy, okay? So uh, think of this, uh, uh, again, uh, the NADH is as this, uh, harvested from glucose as dumping the electrons down this electron transport chain. This electron transport chain will eventually uh, aid in producing ATP, right? Splitting the bonds of a molecule of glucose provides the energy that boosts an electron from a low energy state to a high energy state. Um, yeah, I feel like this is a bad representation of this. Yeah, this is probably a better explanation. Yeah, I don't like that. Um, so a role of oxygen harvesting food energy. In cellular respiration, electrons fall in small steps from food to oxygen producing water. NADH transfers electrons from food to an electron transport chain. The attraction of oxygen to electrons pulls the electrons down the chain, right? So oxygen is going to be that terminal electron acceptor. This... Uh, this pulling of electrons is going to be important, right? And oxygen is going to be the thing that is going to be pulling these electrons down this electron transport chain, uh, and eventually uh, receiving these electrons, um, forming water, okay? Hydrogen electrons and oxygens combine to form water. Uh, 
Um, this can also be an issue, right? Um, again, if you harvest too many electrons, you can, for, for, uh, you can form peroxy radicals. This can easily turn into H2O2, which is peroxide. Again, this is what, which is what I was referring to, the hydrogen peroxide set, that issue that you see uh, uh, with the free radicals forming. Oops, sorry. Huh. Let me think about this. How am I going to explain this? Mm, yeah, so. Yeah, we'll talk about it the other time. But no, oxygen is going to be that main component that drives the electron flow. Okay. Oxygen is our terminal electron acceptor. We need oxygen to survive. This is why. Okay. It is going to pick up our electrons. If we don't have oxygen, we don't have the electron transport chain. We don't have the ability to uh, um, perform this function. You, uh, again, will, will die because you don't have enough uh, ATP being produced at once. So ATP synthesis is the enzyme that actually produces uh, um, ATP, right? A protein cluster found in a cellular membrane, including the inner membrane of the mitochondria, the thylakoid membrane of chloroplast, and the plasma membrane of prokaryotes. Uh, this uses the energy of a hydrogen ion concentration gradient to make ATP from ADP. And ATP synthase provides a port through which hydrogen ion concentration gradient to make uh, ATP from ADP. Uh, and ATP synthase provides a port through which hydrogen ions H plus diffuse. You're like, what the heck? That definition sounds awful. It is awful, but I'll explain it right now. Okay. So I don't need you to know what the cytochrome, these enzymes are. These are cytochrome Cs and different uh, other types of uh, membranes that are found in the mitochondria. Remember, this process is going to be in the mitochondria. The citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain and the ATP synthase complex is inside of that uh, inner wall of the mitochondrial membrane. Okay. Um, so here we have the matrix, right? So this is the inside of the mitochondrion. This is a space between the membranes, right? So this is going to be uh, shown here in the darker uh, structures, right? So this membrane is providing an electrical chemical gradient, okay? So what happens here? What occurs here that allows us to harvest so much energy from glucose, right? One glucose molecule roughly provides 32 ATPs, right? Whereas glycolysis only provides two ATP net gain, right? So how do we get 32 uh, ATP molecules from all this process, right? Because we only get two for a total of two ATP here, but we get all these NADHs and all, uh, and these FADs as well, these FADHs, right? Which is, we don't get energy from it. We need to uh, eventually remove the, the electrons here to make NAD, to go back into glycolysis, to go back in the Krebs cycle, to harvest more electrons, again for this process here right so how does this occur nadh will drop the electrons off into these proteins or these enzymes embedded in that membrane of the mitochondria okay um the dumping of the electrons is the key to how we pump or what we uh, uh have here are these carrier electron carrier proteins that pump protons out into the environment we talked about acid before. We talked about charged molecules uh, in the membrane. We talked about all those different micro components that are going to be important here. Um, NAD, again, will, will utilize the electron transfer to pump hydrogens, right? This is acidifying the environment. This area here in the mitochondria is acidic, okay? What do we know about acids? The, 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 high, the proton is going to have a positive charge. This charge again, is not allowed to pass through this membrane here, okay? Remember, membranes and cells do not let, let charged particles pass through, right? You have that phosphate head. You have the tails that are going to be uh, hydrophobic, again, not allowing these charged particles to pass through, right? So this creates a barrier. This creates a dam that prevents these um, hydrogen molecules from coming through, okay? So NADH will then convert into NAD after they dump the electrons off. NAD will then go back to glycolysis, go back into the citric acid cycle, again, to pull more electrons off, okay? 
of those different carbon molecules, right? So these pumping of electrons, this passage of electrons down these, these different uh, proteins, these different uh, electron uh, transport chain proteins are going to pump protons down uh, uh, out of that uh, area, okay? So again, this passage of electrons, right, NADH dumping these electrons will turn this turbine or allow these enzymes to pump hydrogen molecules out of that space into this, uh, this membrane or this, uh, uh, this in-between membrane space here, right? This darker, uh, looks like brown, darker tan color, right? So these areas in the mitochondria are incredibly acidic and they're also charged. This is what makes the electrochemical gradient. Chemicals referring to the acidic component of this, right? The H plus and then the electrical component. Again, this is a positive charge that's gonna be separated by this membrane, right, this space, okay? These embedded proteins are crucial. These are cytochrome uh, uh, membranes. This electron passage down here is going to pump these hydrogen ions out, okay? So why is this important? How does this make ATP? Well, we have something here called the ATP synthase complex, right? ATP synthase complex, crucial for allowing the hydrogens to pump down this gradient back into this space and to perform uh, 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 or to fuse ATP, right? So six, I believe, uh, um, I forgot the efficiency ratio, but hydrogens pump, get pumped back in, are allowed to come back in. Again, because you have this potential energy, um, it'll pump down. Uh, this will uh, provide uh, this enzyme the energy to uh, fix the phosphate to ADP or adenosine diphosphate to create ATP. So this is where we get the majority or all, almost nearly all of our ATP in our cell, right? This enzyme is what's important, right? This is actually going to be making ATP, the ATP synthase complex. The electron transport chain is utilizing uh, uh, the electrons to pump the protons out. So there's no energy here. Energy uh, that is created, or ATP that, or no ATP is created here in these pumps. ATP is created in this uh, ATP synthase complex, right? This is what's creating that. So here we have the hydrogens pumping down that, um, that ATP synthase complex, again, making ATP. How does this work? Why is it important? Um, I like to think of this as a dam, okay? So how does a dam work? A dam has water stored as potential energy, right? You fill the dam up or you little artificial lake um, and you, uh, you allow that water to pass through that dam. And when that water passes through the dam, it turns a turbine, right? And this is essentially the same thing. The turning of the turbine will then create electricity, right? Here we have the turning of this enzyme or turning of this, this membrane or protein, membrane protein that will, the turning will then be utilized to fix the phosphate to ATP or ADP to make ATP, okay? So protons pump, they turn this turbine. Again, very similar to how a dam works. Uh, instead of electricity, we get ATP, okay? All right. So an overview, this will be the last slide and then we'll cover, we'll go over lab. I know this is my machine. All right, that's fine. Okay, so glycolysis. Glucose is split, broken down into two pyruvic acids. We have uh, harvesting of NADH, right, uh, which is a total net gain of two ATP here. Glycolysis can occur without the use of uh, the mitochondria, okay? It doesn't need any of these processes here. Glycolysis can happen independently of that, right? So what else happens? We have uh, the citric acid cycle. Uh, again, occurring where we harvest six NADHs and two FADs. Again, they're going to be utilized uh, in the electron transport chain, right? We only gain two ATP here. This process is inefficient compared to glycolysis, right? If we do not have a functional mitochondria and we do not have a functional electron transport chain, this becomes dangerous, right? Um, and we'll talk about that in fermentation. But uh, all these NADs, so there is also a process after glycolysis where acetyl-CoA is created. 
uh, but it's a removal of the NADH molecule. Uh, not too impo It's important, but I don't need you to know that. I really just want you to understand the, the, these processes. If I call this the citric acid, the ETC, and the ATP synthase complex, okay? Um, so again, these NADHs will then be removed in the citric acid cycle. Again, you get very little energy for the amount of investment you're removing off from these NADHs and the FADH. This will dump the electrons down the electron transport chain. Remember, oxygen is gonna be facilitating the moving of the electrons. These electrons will then pump or acidify these membranes in the mitochondria, right? These membranes here, shown in the arrow. Uh, these, this area will be incredibly acidic because of these electron the electrons that are passing down these membranes or these proteins that are going to be pumping out these protons, right? ATP synthase will then uh, be uh, um, use that potential energy created by that electrochemical gradient, those protons, those hydrogens being pumped in. These pumping of the hydrogens will then turn a turbine protein, will then, which then will fix uh, ADP with uh, uh, phosphate to make ATP. Okay, and you get a maximum about 32 uh, enzymes. Um, yeah, and we'll finish this later. I'll review it again. Um, this is incredibly important that you understand this. So uh, we'll stop it here. Um, and I'll review it again next time because I know that this is, uh, this is important. Any questions? Yeah, I'll send an email. Sorry, uh, I didn't see that. Yes, I'll send an email uh, Tuesday for the link to the review, okay? Um, don't worry, this topic is not gonna be covered uh, on the exam. It'll be chapters one through five. Um, Cause yeah, this is new and this is gonna take a little bit to, uh, we'll definitely review this multiple times, uh, the respiration, things like that. Okay, let me see. All right, for live today. It's going to be similar to the fermentation. Um, I was supposed to talk about fermentation today, but we didn't get to it. It's okay. Um, we'll definitely get into it. Um, later on. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a, an early review for uh, next week, but we're going to look for uh, differences in uh, um, photosynthesis, photosynthesis and um, um, respiration. Okay, so we're looking at plants. We're looking to see how uh, plants will respire. We have something called a respirometer. This is going to be measuring the amount of gas uh, or oxygen consumed from inside the experiment container. Okay, um, essentially, remember oxygen is used uh, during uh, respiration, right? Uh, so we pull oxygen in and it gets removed. Um, there's going to be a couple of different uh, components here that you need to know. Um, Right, we have uh, um, these various components here that are going to be needed to be added to the different systems. Um, you will be measuring the amount of, of respiration each of these different, uh, either soybeans or non-germinating soybeans and glass beads. Right, glass beads is going to be a control. Okay, um, but we're just essentially seeing what germinating soybeans need in order to uh, start growing. Right, plants do perform respiration uh, with photosynthesis. Right. Plants will utilize their own energy uh, and storage molecules, um, right? Starch is another great uh, storage molecule for pl plants. It's a bunch of glucose molecules attached to each other. But we're essentially looking at how the soybeans are going to be uh, um, using up the oxygen in the system, okay? And you're just going to be measuring that. Um, yeah, that's about it. This is... Just please read through the lab. Again, it's going to just really enhance the, the, the lecture. Um, I know this lab will be kind of confusing for some individuals because of, uh, because of what we're using, right? 
So glass beads, again, is the control. The germinating soybeans are going to be what is going to be using the most oxygen in the system, right? Because these are actually going to be growing. And these beans are not photosynthetic yet, right? The beans need to grow, produce the pigments, have uh, uh, everything set up for photosynthesis. Essentially, what we're looking for is, um, is uh, what, these, what type of metabolic rate that uh, these soybeans are going to be uh, performing in term and in comparison to the non-germinating soybeans, right? So these are again these these soybeans are going to be not uh, uh, germinating or non-functional, whereas these germinating soybeans are going to start ready to uh, to be sprouting and growing. Okay, um, you also the way we're measuring um, the oxygen consumption again. Remember during respiration, uh, we the the cell gives off CO two right and pulls in oxygen. Well, we can absorb CO2 with cotton balls uh, and polyester uh, fluffs. Again, this is going to be plugging um, that system. You add potassium hydroxide. Uh, this will allow for the carbon dioxide that's being off-gassed from these germinating soybeans to be absorbed. Okay, So CO2 will not be converted into gas, right? Because that will distort your reading or your options here. Because again, if you're giving off oxygen and or you're taking in oxygen, right? This will go down, but you're also giving off CO2. So this bead would not move if you're not somehow absorbing the carbon dioxide, right? So I want to breathe in, breathe in oxygen, breathe out CO2 in equal amounts, right? So if, I'm, if this soybean is doing that, you will not see the bead move. That's why you will utilize um, the cotton balls and the potassium hydroxide on the polyester fluff. Again, this will be absorbing the carbon dioxide that's uh, released by those soybeans during respiration. Therefore, you can see, you can see the, um, oops, you can see this bead dropping, right? CO2 is being absorbed by that, the, those cotton balls, um, and the only thing being consumed is oxygen. So you'll see this bead kind of drop, okay? So, and you'll just measure that. You'll just measure the respiration um, of each uh, uh, germinating soybean, okay? And just answer the question that you've done. There's a couple of questions about um, this lab, uh, through McGraw Hill as well. So you have like a little quiz. Okay. Um, you'll also have another quiz uh, to that I'll upload um, Thursday. Again, you'll have till Saturday. So just please make sure you're checking your canvas for that. Okay. I know some people missed the quiz. Don't worry, it's only ten points. You'll get an extra credit quiz later. Um, just make sure you're keeping up with your work. All right. So. Uh, it's important. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? I know this is a lot of information today. This one's probably going to be one of the more rough uh, uh, lectures that we have. Okay. So, um, yeah. But any questions? If not, um, remember test is uh, on chapters one through five. Um, it'll be through Canvas. You'll have about an hour uh, on the on review or on Tuesday. I'll provide. Uh, I'll upload that if you're not able to make it, but. I will provide like a brief overview of how the exam is going to go. Okay. So I'm just about done finishing uh, making the exam. Um, there's going to be free response, multiple choice, uh, true, false, things like that uh, on the exam. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too bad. Okay. So uh, any questions? If not, um, I will see you uh, Tuesday, unless you want to uh, send me an email or drop in for my office hours on Thursday. Again, office hours on Thursday are by request only. I won't send the link to you because that's set up for my micro class. But if you would like, you can send me an email. Most most of the time, people don't um, don't drop in, so you're fine.